morning and welcome to Wintersville United Methodist Church. I'm so glad that you have decided to join us today for this online worship experience. And I pray that you know that you are loved and I pray that after watching this video, you have a better understanding of God's true love for you. Welcome. Give me to drink. How is it that thou being a Jew Ask a drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria. The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. <laughs> Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Whosoever shall drink of this well shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water which I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. Sir, give me of this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Go. Call thy husband, and come hither. I have no husband. Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall, neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, and salvation is of the Jews. And the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him, for unto such hath God promised his spirit. And they who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I know that Messiah cometh, who is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. I who speak unto thee am he. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father God, you're such a good God, and I thank you that we could get online and worship you, God, that we don't have to be in a church or in a building, that we can just be, you can just be with us wherever we are in this world. So God, I just pray that as we worship you today, as we read your word, as we hear the story of the woman at the well, that you just, that you just be here, be in our presence, 
and that my words be your words, and that all that I say brings glory to you, God. I just thank you so much for Wintersville United Methodist Church, and I just pray you continue to be with us in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. shackled me but God in heaven heard my plea then Jesus, Jesus rescued me oh Jesus, Jesus rescued me I will see forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praise It floods my soul and hope eternal won't let go. My daddy race at Calvary. Cause Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Oh, Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will see forever of your love come down. It's my hands to heaven. Shout your praise. The grave is empty, I am free, cause Jesus, Jesus rescued me, oh Jesus, Jesus rescued me, yeah. one, two, three, I will see forever of your love come down, with my hands to heaven, shout your praises loud, I was lost in darkness, you pulled me out, I will see you about one of my most favorite Bible stories. Earlier this summer, Pastor Clint did a series on favorite Bible stories in the Bible, and he skipped over mine. So today I want to talk to you about the woman at the well, and I will touch base on five C words. So imagine, if you will, two strangers met beside a well one hot afternoon in Samaria. One was a woman, the other was a man. We don't know the woman's name, but we do know the name of the man. His name was Jesus. Their brief conversation changed her life. Although 2,000 years ago have passed since Jesus walked on earth, his words remain incredibly relevant. Time changes, but the human heart remains the same. We have the same hopes and fears and dreams and doubts, and we struggle with the same problems. Some might have uncontrolled anger, we all make foolish choices. We have misplaced priorities. Some of us suffer from guilt. Some of us have misguided ambitions, limited faith, convenient excuses. Some of us even have nagging doubt. Some of us have broken dreams, and a lot of us have personal failures. And I bet even then, when Jesus walked this earth, people struggled with those same things. Sometimes I hear people talk about how the Bible isn't relevant, but we need to make the Bible relevant. 
What an odd notion that is. But remember, all you have to do to make the Bible relevant is to make the Bible clear. Tell it like it is. Don't change the Bible. Tell it like it is, and it will be so relevant that maybe even some people may not want to hear it. The story of Jesus and the woman at the well is very familiar. As I have studied it the past few weeks, I've been struck by how simple and profound it is. A man meets a woman in a seemingly chance encounter. In a brief moment of, and in that brief moment, her life has changed forever. There are lessons here about racial prejudice, religious hatred, and dealing with moral outcasts. This story also conveys valuable truth about how we can do evangelism. As we begin, I should note that I believe this is one, probably one of the longest conversations recorded in the Bible. It's such, such, such detail, this conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well. So imagine, if you will, it was a hot day. The sun beat down on a man's head. The sweat poured off his brow as he walked along a dusty road. It was probably mid to late July when the temperatures could top 105 degrees. To make matters worse, he had been traveling with his friends since sunrise. Now that the sun was directly overhead, they were hurrying to make their way through this part of the country as quickly as possible. He came to a well with a rock ledge built above the ground, which was very typical in the Middle East. He sat on the lip of the well and thought to himself, oh, if only I could have a drink of water. At that precise moment, a woman came along. It wasn't the normal time, and it was very unusual to come to the well alone, but this woman was different. The Bible says she came from a tiny village of Sakar. We know basically where Sakar was. It was in Samaritan territory. And Jews avoided this territory at all cost. The well was about one half mile outside the village. It was called Jacob's Well, after the patriarch who first dug that well 2,000 year, years earlier. Weary travelers from throughout Israel knew of this place where they could go and get a drink of water and where they could draw from the well. As the woman looks at Jesus and he at her, there were four invisible walls, I think, that stood between them. There was a religious wall, there was a gender wall, a racial wall, and a moral wall. Yet our Lord, our Lord Jesus, found the way through all of them. He found her, and then she found him. So like I said, I have five C's I want to touch on. My first C is contact. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus didn't do the baptizing, his disciples did. When Jesus learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to this town named Sychar, near the plot ground of Jacob, um, and Je Jacob's well was there. And Jesus was very tired from the journey, so he sat down. It was about the sixth hour. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And this comes from John 4. Geography is all important in understanding this story. In Jesus' day, there were three regions stacked one on top of each other. There was Galilee in the north, Samaria in the middle, and Judea in the south. The easiest and quickest way to get to Galilee from Judea was to go due north right through Samaria. Verse 3 says that Jesus did not have to go through Samaria, but he had to go through Samaria. Now, why did he have to do that? The answer is, is that he didn't. There was another route he could have taken. Some devout Jews would go east, cross the Jordan River, enter Perea and then go north, recross the Jordan River, and then they would be in Galilee. This was way out of the way, but it meant that they wouldn't have to go through Samaritan territory. Some Jews would avoid Samaria at all cost. A little history might help us at this point. The Jews and the Samaritans disliked each other a lot. The Jews looked down on Samaritans as religious and racial half-breed heretics. It's hard for us to understand the animosity that existed between these two groups, but let's just say they didn't like each other, 
and they avoided each other at all cost. Now that brings us back to verse 3. Why did Jesus have to go through Samaria when the Jews either didn't go there or they passed by as quickly as possible? The answer is simple and profound. Jesus went because he intended to meet this woman. He knew she would be coming to the well this day. And he knew that she would be tired from his journey, and he knew that he would meet her. He knew that she would be coming at noon, and he knew that she would be coming alone. Nothing happens by chance in this story. Every detail is part of an outworking of God's will. And that, I think, is hugely important. The woman isn't looking for Jesus. All she wants is water. But Jesus is looking for her. You have to go to Samaria if you want to reach Samaritans. He doesn't avoid Samaria, and he doesn't hurry through it. Though she does not know it, the woman has a divine appointment with the Son of God. From this, we can take a very important principle for evangelism. Reaching people for Christ is not always comfortable and may, times, it may at times be difficult. But you have to go where people are if you want to reach them at all. Comfort is not the issue. The firefighter goes into a burning house to rescue those inside. He can't stay outside and say, come out before the house burns down. Just like this, you have to go to help and save people. Jesus intended to save this woman, so he went where she was. She came alone at noontime. This was potentially dangerous and somewhat unusual. Women normally came together at the well in the morning, but I have a feeling the village woman did not like the Samaritan woman. The fact that this woman comes alone probably means that she had a past and that she was trying to avoid all people at all cost. She might have been ostracized by the village people. The conversation begins with a simple question from Jesus. Will you give me a drink? He is tired and thirsty, and she has the water that he needs. He was thirsty and knew it. She was thirsty and didn't know it. The woman did not come to the well seeking Christ, but he came to the well seeking her. In his approach, we see the great heart of our Lord Jesus that he doesn't have prejudice. We see his heart that is free from prejudice. It matters not to him what others would think. It matters not to him that others think that he's wrong for going through Samaria. Jesus welcomes all and shuns no one. Luke 19.10 tells us that the Lord Jesus came to seek and save the lost. This story tells us what that means. John 4 is sovereign grace. He found her. She didn't find him. The same is true for all of us. You will never come to Christ until Christ first comes to you. What happens in this chapter looks like a chance encounter, but it was nothing of the kind. The time and place and all the circumstances have been arranged by God before the world even began. My second C is challenge. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because remember, Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw from this well, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. There is a triple surprise in this verse. First, the Jews would speak to a Samaritan. That's a big surprise. Second, that a man would speak to a woman he didn't know in public. Third, that a Jew would drink from the same cup as a Samaritan. When the woman saw Jesus, she knew he was a Jew by his dress and probably also by his accent. She knew he was a stranger passing through. 
In the first century, it was almost unheard of of a man to talk to a woman in public in those circumstances. And to ask for a drink of water was even more unusual since the rabbis taught them over and over that it was a sin to touch the utensil that a Samaritan had touched. When Jesus offers her living water, he's being deliberately ambiguous because the phrase could also mean running water. He is trying to incite her curiosity without making her suspicious. You came here for water. I've got the water you've never dreamed of. He is leading her step by step to saving faith. He leads her to see her need and he reveals who he is. And he even offers her something that would change her life. He is not offering to quench her thirst, but to banish her thirst once and for all. This is what we call a teachable moment. I am struck by the fact that Jesus returns again and again to the central issue. Do you know who I am? If you knew my true identity, you could ask and I would give you the water that leads to eternal life. And not drink of water, but a gushing spring that will well up within your heart. Behold in these verses the simplicity of salvation. In verse 10, Jesus says, you would have asked, and I would have given you living water. That's all salvation is. It's asking God to save you and receiving salvation in return. Think about that. Heaven itself is yours for the asking. Just ask for it. That's all. Just ask Jesus with a humble heart to save you. Salvation is yours for the asking. And there is a reminder of all the things, vanity, all the earthly things, Anyone who drinks of the water of the world will thirst again. We all know what it's like to be thirsty, and we all know that the body can live weeks without food, but it can't live days without water. There is a song by We the Kingdom that we're going to close with today that hits this story on the head. The first verse of the song is, Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. In verse 15, the woman says, give me this water. She didn't understand what she meant, but she knew she wanted it. And she knew that it was more than she ever had. My third C is confrontation. Anyone that knows me knows that I don't like confrontation. But our next C is confrontation. He told the woman Go call your husbands and come back. And she replies, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right. You say you have no husband. The fact is, is that you've had five husbands, and the man that you are with now is not even your husband. What you have said is quite true. On one level, it appears that Jesus might be a little insensitive. Why bring up all this stuff of her past? Is Jesus trying to embarrass her? The answer is no. But his instruction to call her husband made her very uncomfortable. So she goes into detail and simply replies, I have no husband, but that wasn't the whole story. She knew that she was hiding the truth, but she doesn't know that Jesus knows the truth. And so he proceeds to reveal the rest of the story. The woman has had five husbands, and the man that she's living with currently is not her husband. In a sense, this is the ultimate reality check. How could a woman in that day have five husbands? Even today, that would be very unusual. Did they die? That's unlikely. Had she divorced five times? Probably. Certainly, she was living in a simple relationship with a man outside of marriage. The words of Jesus are a verbal slap in the face, and yet it was the most loving thing he could have done for her. There is an important spiritual principle at work here. Without conviction of sin, there can be no conversion. God sees behind the mask to the reality within. Until we come to grips with the sickness of sin and our own willful disobedience to God, we cannot be saved. Is Jesus being cruel? No. But just like the doctor prescribes surgery to save your life, Jesus also wants to remove the sin of your life. And sometimes that's painful. In another place, Jesus describes his mission in this way. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that comes from Mark 2.17. Just as the doctors must sometimes seem to hurt in order to heal, even so the great physician of the soul must wound us with the truth about ourselves in order to heal the sickness of our sin. By asking about her husband, he exposes the woman's lifelong pursuit of happiness. Evidently, she entered one relationship after one relationship after one failed relationship after another. And each time she said, this man, this is going to be the time I'll be happy. And each time she was disappointed. Now she won't even risk marriage. But the words of Jesus reveal a deep-seated loneliness, a hole in her heart that no man could fill. Far from being irrelevant, these words of Jesus go to the core of the problem, and probably even the core problem that we have in our lives. Sometimes we jump from relationship to relationship, or one thing from another, hoping that it will make us happy. No human relationship can satisfy our needs. We are spiritual beings made for a relationship with God. There is a God-shaped vacuum inside our human heart that no man or no woman could ever fill. We were made to know God, and until we know him through Jesus Christ, we are doomed to restlessness and despair. Let me pause and ask a question at this point. Does Jesus love this woman? Yes, he does. He knows the truth about her, and he still offers her eternal life. Here is the wonder of God's grace. Only someone who loves you can look past your past without blinking. Real love means knowing the truth about someone else and reaching out to them anyway. Jesus is not ashamed of her past, but he cannot help her until she gets beyond the shame and admits the truth. She is almost there, almost saved, but not quite. She is near the kingdom, but not at the door yet. Jesus revealed what she thought could keep hidden. That always makes sinners uncomfortable. She wants to change the subject, which she tries, and she does. But as we go to the next C, the fourth C, conversion. Conversion is the process of changing or causing something to change from one form to another. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has come now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah, also called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who you speak to am he. It is now clear to this woman that she has met the most unusual man because he knows her past. She thinks he must be a prophet. Since he is a Jew and she is a Samaritan, she begins to go into this debate with him. And that day, Jesus worshipped in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans worshipped in Mount Gerizim. So she wants to know which mountain is right. Jesus doesn't bother debating with her. He simply tells her that a time is coming when geography won't matter. What God wants are people who worship him in truth and spirit. He doesn't condemn her theology and say, you're stupid for worshiping on that mountain, because that wouldn't do any good. It would probably make her angry, and she would probably end the conversation. One of the greatest truths to come out of this story is that God is greater than geography, race, class, sex, and religious traditions. True worship is not about where, or even how, or even when. It's about who you are and who God is. God wants us to worship on truth. God wants us to worship with our heart, our committed heart. There is good news and bad news in this statement. The bad news is is that religious activity really doesn't count. Going to church, being baptized, giving money and all that is good, but not if your heart is not good. 
The reason that those things don't count if your heart is not good is because you're just going through the motions. The reason they don't count is because anyone can do those things and still have a heart of anger, bitterness, hatred, lust, and pride. To worship God, you must accept the truth of the gospel of Jesus. You must have Jesus in your heart to worship. The good news is meant for everyone. This is God's equal access provision. Salvation is not about going to the right mountain. It's about going to Jesus for salvation. And anyone can do that at any time. Slowly the truth is dawning on this woman. She has heard of the Messiah, and she knows that someday he may come to the earth. Imagine her surprise when Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. This is an amazing statement from our Lord. Here he plainly claims to be the Messiah, and he does it in a unique way. In Greek, it reads something like this, the one who speaks to you, I am. But I am was the name by which God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 3. Jesus is claiming identity with God. No doubt this woman was blown away. I can't imagine what she was feeling. She came for some water in the middle of the day, and she ends up meeting the water of life face to face. Her life was changed. Which brings me to my fifth and final C, changed. A little phrase at the end of verse 42 tells us that the hated Samaritans figured out something the Jews never really got. They understood that Jesus was indeed the savior of the world. They heard this woman's testimony and they heard Jesus and they believed in him. In the end, you can't be saved on secondhand faith. You aren't going to heaven because your mom's a youth pastor, or your mom's a godly woman, or your father was a pastor or a missionary. You've got to make a decision on your own. You cannot live off your parents' faith, or your wife's faith, or your children's faith. You can't live off of that. Sooner or later, you've got to step forward and say, yes, I believe in Jesus, and he is my Lord and Savior. And that leads me back to the crucial phrase in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Ponder those three little words, if you knew. If you knew who I was, you would ask and I would give you eternal life. Ask yourself, do you know who he is? If so, will you ask him for living water? If you want to go to heaven, all you have to do is ask. That's how simple salvation is. It's like asking for a refreshing drink, a refreshing cool glass of water. So let me summarize some of these things we learned from this wonderful story. A, no one is too simple to be saved. B, no one is so lost that the Lord cannot find them. C, no one can be saved without facing their sinful past. D, no one who faces their sinful past will be turned away from Jesus. And E, no one who meets Jesus will ever be the same again. Jesus is ready to give us living water. It's free for the asking. Are you ready to receive it? What a story. What a Christ. What an amazing grace. Amen.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
A closing benediction comes from 1 John 3, verse 1. See how much the Father has loved us. His Son is so great that we are called children of God, because that's what, in fact, we are. May you know that you are loved by an almighty God, and he is seeking for you, and all you have to do is ask, because he's waiting with open arms.